while I slept, and was, or while I had nightmares about rogue states and Al Qaeda, while I was sleeping, what happened with? It? Tell us about what, what did Russia and China, what have they been up to? Yeah, I think I think uh, two basic things. I mean, one is um, fundamentally is China. Uh, and Napoleon said it a long time ago, which is when China rises, the world will shake, and it's finally happened. And of course, even if China were a uh, democratic government, this would be very significant, but it's not. It's a, a government with a uh, Marxist-Leninist uh, party system. Uh, and what's China been doing? Well, China has spent the last uh, 40 years growing at a you know, 7 to 10% clip, which accumulates over time. Uh, we'd all like to have investments like that. And it's been spending, increasing its defense budget by uh, roughly that amount, if not more than the rate of growth. And that's taken it from essentially a peasant army in the 1970s uh, to one that can contest at the frontier of uh, advanced military development. Um, the Russians are a different story. Uh, the Russians obviously went into a nosedive after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, and in the 90s, they were uh, very low. With the uh, Vladimir Putin's accession to power in 2000, they basically began a, a military sort of restoration campaign. And over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, they've invested a lot in, in, yes, nuclear weapons, which tends to get the most attention, but also in their conventional forces. The upshot of this is that both of these states now have the ability increasingly to military parlance to hold at risk uh, allies or, in the case of Taiwan, a kind of quasi-ally of the United States uh, in ways that they could have a plausible theory of victory. And of course, they're doing a lot of other stuff. Fundamentally, I think the Chinese want to attain regional hegemony so they can set the terms of trade and, and make the world safe for China rather than for America. And that will make us poorer and less free over time. And I can go to that. And the Russians are a little bit different. Uh, my good friend Wes Mitchell will, uh, refers to them as kind of a, a rating power that wants to keep the, um, the international system disrupted to give them freedom of maneuver uh, and probably dissolve the NATO alliance. But that's kind of the, the long and short of it. The, I guess the bottom line would be unipolarity is over. Our strategic edge and certainly our military edge uh, has eroded, and we need to take count of that. So let's get into the weeds a little bit. Tell, what it tells about A, A2 D. AD, A2AD. <laughs> what is A2AD? A2AD is, is based, it's anti-access area denial. Basically what this is, is the, uh, you know, taking modern technology like we did in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and turning it to your advantage, particularly with sort of very precise strike weapons. I think Bob Work, uh, who's affiliated here, the former Deputy Secretary of Defense, is very articulate on this point, which is that... Um, Modern warfare is likely to be a contest between battle networks, basically thinking networks that can process information, understand information, and apply effects uh, uh, very precisely. A2AD is basically a move in that direction which says, if you're China, I'm going to build a bunch of radars, I'm going to build a bunch of missiles, I'm going to be able to shoot your, your, your fixed air bases, I'm going to be able to go after your surface ships, I'm going to be able to go after your satellites with missiles, but also with cyber effects, electronic warfare, etc. The, the major strategic reason for, that we are concerned about that is it sounds defensive, but defense can be the prelude to an offense. And our defense perimeter, which is an old term but needs to come back into vogue, our defense perimeter run, runs right along the Chinese coast and right adjacent to Russia in the Baltics. Um, and if they can create a big bubble of, of dominance and prevent our military from getting in there, then they would be able to uh, suborn uh, our allies or partners in that, in that, in that, um, under that shadow. So our history would say, you know, we we've been slow to anger, uh, but the United States has a pretty good record. What did Churchill say? You, America could be counted on do, to do all the wrong things before it finally does the right thing, right. and that has meant that eventually we muster our will and mm -hmm. and and come back. We mm -hmm. did it in World War One and World War Two. We did it in Desert Storm. Why isn't that a viable? Why not do that? A couple things. Um, I think there was a fundamental change uh, after the Second World War in the sense that traditionally we were es essentially an isolationist power. Now, I think that we've had a consistent strategic interest throughout the history of the Republic, which is that we did not want another major wealthy area of the world to be dominated by a single power that could then dominate the commerce there and ultimately project power from it. Now, in Europe, we didn't need to do that. We were the original free rider, so Great Britain did that for us. So the Monroe Doctrine could only exist because the Royal Navy prevented European powers from projecting power uh, into uh, the Western Hemisphere. That actually, I think, explains partially why we were more active in Asia throughout our history, because we always wanted to make sure you go back to the open door policy of John Hay, you go back to the opening of Japan, 
Those are all about ensuring unfettered trade and access into that region. Um, we, after the First World War, we made the mistake of coming home, uh, and uh, Germany and, and Japan were able to rise and were able to create new facts on the ground uh, in both cases. And it took an enormous effort. It took mobilizing 15 million men, I think, you know, 50% of the economy, hundreds of thousands of casualties, et cetera, uh, to defeat Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. Whereas if we had faced, stuck with the French and the British on the Rhine in 1936 or even in 1940, we would have been able to have a much better position. Imagine if we had been fighting with France as a defended entity rather than having to re reconquer them. I mean, D-Day, we will honor it uh, next month, but D-Day is evidence of a mistake. And so we recognize that after the Second World War, particularly because we, we recognize that only the United States could play the fundamental cornerstone balancer function that was required, particularly in Europe at that time, against the power of the scale of the Soviet Union. And so we decided to stay forward, not because you know our instinct, of course, is to come home. That's the natural instinct. But that over time, we'd be better off with a stable situation where they'd be deterred. We've, we've continued to do that over time. We've had a forward engagement strategy. Now, I, my view, as I think you know, is that I think we've gone astray in a lot of ways, like in Iraq and uh, Libya and some other things over the last 25 years and lost our focus and what we need to do and what we don't need to do. Um, but what the real, the particular problem is now is less a kind of a geopolitical strategy of forward engagement. It's more a military problem, which is the fait accompli. So the fait accompli is the best strategy for a weaker power in, in macro terms to take on and win uh, uh, a, a war, especially under the nuclear shadow. Because the fait accompli basically says, I'm going to create new facts on the ground. Uh, in the case of China, it would probably be Taiwan, almost certainly. And in the case of Russia, it would be the Baltics. And then present a situation that's a, some combination of too risky and costly, doesn't seem legitimate, doesn't seem reasonable or justifiable to do the thing that you need to do in response. And that gets back to the A2AD point, which is the stronger your A2AD network, the bigger it is, it, the costlier and riskier and more aggressive it seems to, to turn those facts around. And so when you add nuclear weapons, to the mix, then you get really complicated. And that's particularly, the case. that's particularly a problem with the Russians, which we can discuss if you want. But, but I think that's what a, a big part of what I'm arguing in the piece, and, and in general, is we need a combat credible forward presence. We need to be able to defeat, ideally, the fait accompli, which is a different standard. So than let's get a, a little granular about yeah. this without getting too far into the weeds. Yeah. But you know, talk about the force we, we, we are forward based. Mm -hmm. OK, we already are. So what's the force now, and why is that inadequate to the task? The force today is basically a force that assumes something like the Desert Storm model. So my, my favorite example in the, when I talk about in the piece is the Desert Storm model is how the American military is primed to operate, particularly after the Cold War, which is an adversary like Saddam Hussein takes over Kuwait, and then we say, okay, we put up, in, in the case of in August 1990, or I think we put maybe the 82nd or something, a very light tripwire force that the Iraqis could have rolled over. And then we took four months. We built a coalition. We flowed a ton of force forward. We got good and ready. We launched a dominating air campaign. Uh, and, then, and then we kicked them out of, of Kuwait. That relied on a couple things. It relied on secure basing and uninhibited access and the ability to build up that iron mountain of capability. And then when we were good and ready, we could dominate the whole environment. The Iraqis didn't have nuclear weapons, so we could kind of unilaterally, in a sense, bound the conflict. I mean, all conflict, almost all conflict in human history is limited in one way or the other, and certainly under the nuclear shadow. So we could kind of pick the, pick the boundaries and then just pound them uh, at, at will without, without you know, fear of, of transgressing any meaningful full boundaries, and, and basically. That doesn't work anymore. The A2AD stuff allows the Chinese and the Russians to attack early and, and contest that ability to flow those forces forward. So, for instance, in the Pacific, you know, uh, in the old days, there were more bases. There was Clark and Subic, and we had much more in, 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 um, in the Pacific Islands. After the Cold War, we concentrated Okinawa, Guam, a couple other places, obviously bases in Japan, because we said, well, they can't hit us here with precision, so we'll just operate like an airport. You know, you, let's have a hub. Well, now the Chinese have gone to town on that, and they've got that whole thing. You know, you can be sure they've got it zeroed in. They do, they do uh, tests with like clearly mock-up dummies of facilities at Guam or in Japan in the in the Western Desert 
So they're practicing very precisely. So as they may make their lunch for Taiwan, yeah. they would take out our peripheral bases. So they could go about it in different ways, but basically they would either do that or we knew that we know they'd, be, we'd, they'd do that. And that, that's actually one of the issues that's important. But I mean, from their point of view, they could make it really, really hard just as a matter of practical reality to help defend Taiwan. Uh, and they could certainly raise the costs and risks really, really high. And, you know, one of the things that we've forgotten is that our interest in defending our allies is not total. You know, I mean, it's kind of basic, but Americans are kind of got the blob has sort of gotten into, into the habit of saying, well, we stand by our allies 100 percent, whatever, no, no, no restrictions. And that's obviously not true. Right. I mean, our interest in defending our allies is really deep, but it's limited. You know, and it has to be related to something that Americans actually care about. So we have to think seriously about how we fight a war to defend our allies in a way that Americans will say, OK, that I can I can I can support that. Well, well let's do that, because maybe yeah. a lot of Americans would say, well, I'm sorry about Taiwan, mm -hmm. but too bad. Totally possible, uh, which is this. That's why you. And But by the way, if they could say that about Japan, they could say that about Germany. They could say that about France. And I mean, I was in a debate one time with Barry Posen, the academic from MIT, who was saying, well, you know, we're never going to trade, want to get in a nuclear war over the Baltics. And my feeling is, with all due respect from our friends from California, I don't want to get in a nuclear war over California. Right? So, like, you've got to draw a line somewhere. Right? And that's, that's the logic of a, of a defense perimeter. And so what you do is you, you force them to attack you in a way that shows that they're aggressive and brazen and they can't be trusted. And they attack you in a way that is so big and so nasty and engages such a broad uh, uh, sort of panoply of your capabilities and your you know, life that you have the resolve. And then you also, at the same time, you try to bring down the costs, right? So this is why nuclear escalation threats aren't, aren't great or horizontal escalation threats over limited interests. You know? If you're France, you can have a nuclear policy against the Soviet Union of saying, if you come across the Rhine, I'm going to blow up Moscow. Yeah, you're going to blow up Paris, but I just went through an occupation. And I don't want to do that again. But that's not credible for extended deterrence for an ally out there. The whole point of our military is to try to bring it down so that it can be somewhat consistent. And I think there's a lot of historical evidence here. I mean, in a sense, what we want is we want the, German, uh, the Chinese to do what the Japanese essentially voluntarily did in 1941. You know, my, one of my favorite examples is if, and you know this better than anybody, if the Japanese had not attacked the American possessions in the Pacific, but it just focused on the European colonial possessions, and if they had behaved in a civilized way, would the American people, A, have gone to war, but B, gone to war in such a way that was necessary to push the Japanese back in the dogged way that they fought? I don't know. I mean, A, you're going to fight to defend European colonial possessions. And so the Japanese did it voluntarily, which was epically uh, misguided. But um, another example is, you know, Lincoln got the South to fire first, and that 75,000 troops or whatever volunteered in the next, in the next month. That's the kind of thing where, but you've got to actually array your forces to do that. And that's the way actually things were in the latter part of the Cold War is it was not a tripwire force in Europe. It was a force that was going to compel the Soviets to come in in such a big way that it was going to make going to nuclear seem plausible. So without getting into every weapon system, yeah. what would that force look like on the Pacific perimeter first yeah. and, then, and then do the Russia? Piece. Well, the first thing to remember, and I think I don't talk a lot about specific weapon systems because I think there's a really important role between the sort of grand strategy level and the military operational kind of force structure level. <clears throat> the, the key thing that the American military needs to focus on and its allies, so this article is meant as much for allies as for the American military, is on blunting. So you, we, And blunting means you delay, degrade, or ideally deny the fait accompli. So that means, and Dave Ockmanic from Rand, I think, puts this very well, if you sink three, 300, 350 amphibious ships in the Taiwan Strait, they're not, it's, the Chinese are going to have a lot of trouble sustaining an invasion of, of Taiwan. You know, Hitler had total military dominance on continental Europe. He couldn't figure out how to get across the English Channel. Now, we had to do a bunch of other things to actually unseat him, but the, the parallel holds. In Europe, it's the same logic. It's blunt, the fait accompli in the Baltics and, and eastern Poland. Again, to use Dave Ockmanek's you know, thing, it's, uh, I think, 2,000 to 2,500 armored vehicles in the first 72 hours. That is very doable for the American military, especially, especially against the Chinese. We couldn't already do that, sink 350 amphibious ships? We could, but the way the American military has developed is a lot of shorter range aircraft, a uh, limited number of precision munitions. For instance, I think until recently, we, the Harpoon anti-ship, and people in the audience can correct me, the anti-ship missile 
was, uh, I think, the Navy standing. I, mean, I think it was barely on Navy service ships because they didn't have to worry about killing other ships because the American Navy was so dominant. And that, the harpoon was, I think, from the 70s. Now, the Navy's commendably moving on this, could be doing more as always. But, you know, there's just some basics. And also, we have a lot of shorter range aircraft that operate with munitions that themselves are shorter range. Now, the problem is if they're bombarding your bases or killing your aircraft on the, on the runway or shooting it down on its way or cyber jamming or jamming your, your targeting, yeah. suddenly you're not in such a good shape. Now, we can do it, but it's not easy. And so we need a force structure that can sort of do it f more effectively and from further distance. Yeah, it's interesting because it's, 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 it's a forward presence, but it doesn't mean the ma uh, it's not the Maginot Line. It's more like, it from yeah, like so blunting, particularly in the Pacific, it's probably going to be a lot of naval and air forces. And actually, I think the Army can play a big role, but through long-range missiles. Now that we're at INF, that's an Army mission, traditionally. Uh, you know, there's debates between them and the Air Force, but... If the Army got into, or the Marines, uh, ground-based uh, anti-ship munitions or land attack munitions, that's great, you know? And, and so briefly do the, 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 the Baltics piece of this. Yeah, the interesting thing is the Chinese are by far the more serious challenge over time. Um, and Taiwan is the number one thing that the American military should be focused on, on rectifying because it's a, it is actually, and you'll appreciate this, I think, it's a little bit of a Berlin situation if we're not careful. It's actually an easier problem than Berlin because it is defensible, unlike Berlin. But it's something that they, we think, some people here think that we're not committed, but we are, and everybody would regard it as a bellwether. So you can't be half pregnant. You know, we, we really risk a 1950 situation where we think we haven't committed and we give a yellow light, um, and then we're likely to get into a war that we're not prepared for. And by the way, the Chinese have an incentive to do something about Taiwan, not only because they care about unifying with Taiwan, but they can embarrass us too. It's like a, it's like a jackpot situation. By the way, a member of the Politburo last week was saying to the, there was a mainland affairs meeting, they, they do Taiwan PRC meetings, and uh, he was saying, don't, don't work with the Americans. We beat them in the 1950s when we were so much weaker. You, you're stupid to go with, you'd be stupid to go with them. So that's their message. So we gotta, we gotta show them that's, that's not right um, uh, in a credible way. Um, but actually, the Baltics, in a way, are a tougher problem in the near term for a couple of reasons. One is military. It's just the physical contiguity. I mean, there, there's no geographical feature between the Baltic states and core Russia. I mean, St. Petersburg is right there, the Western Military District. So that means it's very easy to get across it, unlike the 100 nautical miles of the Taiwan Strait. Secondly, um, the Russians have a – this is a sort of a, um, a kind of – struggling for a term for it, but it's kind of the paradox of weakness advantage, which is that they could get, um, if they tried to do a fait accompli thing, and the, the political situation were sufficiently um, confused, our response might need to be so big and nasty and kind of all-encompassing and expansive to eject them from the Baltics that it legitimately might appear to jeopardize Russia proper, and, and certainly Kaliningrad, which is the oblast, which is se separated, all East Prussia, but even St. Petersburg and, and Russia itself, that would increase the, the, the rationality and, the, and thus the credibility of their threats to go nuclear. You know, and so they, they might do this strategically or they might do it just kind of as a, as a matter of course, but that then might induce us to be more cautious and restrained, which would diminish our ability to kick them out right. of the Baltics. They, they would know that. And they know all this. Yeah. I mean, in a way, it's a little bit like um, I think uh, Eisenhower didn't want to deploy uh, conventional forces to um, Europe in the early stages of the Berlin crisis because right. he didn't want to give the, the Soviets the impression that we were prepared yeah, to fight yeah, a no, conventional he, they, war. His advisors were saying I mean, increase them, and he said reduce them. Reduce them. They're like, I'm, he's like, I'm ready. Yeah. But that, kind of, that was great for Ike because he had a nuclear monopoly, but we don't have that anymore. So uh, let's bring the nuclear piece into this. Mm -hmm. Uh, how does that? It's all it's all shattered by nuclear, right? I mean, in the sense that I mean, a lot of people who work on these issues approach it from kind of conventional, conventional in the tech, not not as in uh, standard, but conventional war kind of thinking. I tend to approach these things from sort of the abstract strategic level down in in the sense of nuclear. And and I mean, I think uh, Paul Nitza put it well once. I think in like. A long time ago, but I uh, said, you know, all wars in the nuclear age are nuclear in a sense, right? There's a, I was doing some research a few years in, ago on the Yom Kippur War, and one of the American principals was saying, 
we didn't ever talk about nuclear weapons, but they're always in the back of our mind, and that was in a relatively small war. I, from the first get-go, everybody would be thinking, what if this thing goes, goes thermonuclear? Then we're all dead, right? So, so there's always a, a brinksmanship issue at the end of the equation. And, every, and like in any negotiation, right which is essentially what it is, people are going to be thinking about, if this escalated, do I, how, do, how does this go for me? Or the, how do the costs and benefits go? The point for us is, and, uh, is that I think one, one thing is we do not want to rely as – we want to diminish the degree to which we rely on our resolve in a contest with the Chinese and the Russians. And that applies both to go to nuclear and also some people argue for horizontal escalation, which basically turns into like counter-blockading each other and societal suffering. It doesn't really work, but you hear it sometimes. But basically, you know, A, we don't – we don't, we don't necessarily win a, a contest to resolve about the Baltics. I mean, how many Americans can tell you where Latvia is or Taiwan? Whereas, whereas in, in, in China, uh, uh, Taiwan is a regular part of the kind of national discourse. It's part of their national uh, propaganda identity. So we don't, we don't necessarily going to win that. And it doesn't make sense. Anyway, we don't want that situation. Um, but they can, go, they can go there, potentially, right? And so... I think what, what the, the reason for the focus on the fait accompli in, in large part is we want basically if things go to the nuclear level, I think what we want to hope for is a stalemate. Like it's really hard to make a nuclear strategy that can force the other guy to do something he doesn't want without bringing too much risk onto yourself. If you're, if you're Ike and you're dealing with the North Koreans and, and, the, and, the, and the Soviets and the Soviets don't have the ability to hit the American mainland, you know, homeland, well, then you've got a lot of leverage in 1953. And even then, it was hard. Today, if we get into a, you know, we and the Russians are going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe over, the, over the Baltics, I think the natural in inclination is for things to sit where they, where they are. In that case, how the conventional forces end up is really important. And that's why we want, it, we want to be forward, and we don't want to allow them to, because if Hitler had had nuclear weapons in 1940, he would have said, if, if, you get, if, you, if, you, if you launch the Armada, I'm going to nuke you in the, in, the, in the channel or whatever, you know? Um, so that's kind of how the nuclear piece comes in. Uh, I want to get into how, how much of a sea change this is and what we're already doing and politically how, yeah. how plausible it is. But let's open this up to questions right away because we got a lot of people who are, who are interested in the subject and have something to add to it. You say that a, uh, a strangulation strategy like that would not work. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people look at that as a uh, crack in the system, like a way to do it. Why do you think that? No, great question. And Mark Kansian from CSIS is a real expert on, on these issues. Um, I would say a lot of Military people or defense people tend to think it's an attractive strategy. I really doubt the American people would think it's a very attractive strategy, uh, since it's going to be it's going to have um, uh, uh, enormous implications for them that I'm not sure they're fully fully aware of. Um, I think the, the 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 strangulation strategy doesn't work for for a couple of reasons. Um, Spell out the strangulation. So strangle is basically a distant blockade, right? That that let's say China takes Taiwan. And the United States cuts off the Straits of Malacca and, and performs a distant blockade and gives up trying to contest uh, uh, inner, more inwardly. Now, first of all, militarily, I'm not sure it's going to work because the Chinese, in fact, I doubt it would work because the Chinese will see that we are moving away from a military that's designed to, to contest them uh, in the interior. And then they can increasingly shape their forces to go out and project power and contest our blockade, right? So, like, they're already there. Not secondly, they're already anticipating this. This is one of the functions of, one, of presumably, of Belt, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is to diversify your sources and not be so exposed to the um, uh, to to a strangulation strategy. Um, thirdly, it doesn't work politically with allies because it's basically like we are going to win by starving people on in China over something that they claim is part of their core national sovereignty or. If it became, even if it was over the Philippines, for instance, or Japan, it would be dominance in Asia. So it's a big thing for them. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll get back to you guys. I mean, basically, you're saying, if you're doing the distant blockade, you're basically saying, I'm not going to help defend Japan or the Philippines. Because if you're giving up Taiwan, suddenly they've got Taiwan, and then they adapt their forces, and then they say, I'm going to do the same thing, 
or they, they don't even have to, because the rational point, the rational strategy for Manila or Tokyo would be to accommodate at that point, because the Americans are way out there. So it doesn't, and you need those allies and partners to help you enforce any such blockade. Fourth. I'm not sure the Russians or the Central Asian states, given the price that the Chinese would pay, they would have enormous resources to uh, be able to, to get around a blockade. Fifth, I think the Chinese would already have anticipated any such distant blockade in whatever decision. So this is what sometimes people say, well, we can hit them in Djibouti or in, we can hit their interests in Argentina or whatever. They're going to price that in. The, the prize of Taiwan, which is A, valuable, but B, the first step towards regional hegemony, they'll get that stuff back later. Because they'll, they'll cement their control over Asia, and then whatever residual influence we have in Latin America, they can contest when they want to, if they care about it. Um, finally, I would say, uh, uh, I don't think there's an example of a, of a strangulation strategy actually working. And I've been thinking about this a lot recently. There's a guy named Dan Altman at um, Georgia State, who just independently, I mean, we, some of us have been thinking about this here for a couple of years, but he independently has been arguing about the, the fait accompli being the real problem. He did a data set study of uh, forced you know, uh, territorial changes since World War II, I think, and you know, people can check my math on this. But I believe there were 84 cases of, of this, and there were 82 were fait accompli, and two were by coercion, basically. Um, and they were, I think it was like Indonesia against like, you know, Papua New Guinea or something like that. And part of that is because I think states always choose to do the fait accompli. I mean, we could have starved the South for 10 more years into subjugation, but instead we said, oh, we'll, do, we'll do that and then we'll, we'll beat their armies in the field. And I think the basic point is the blockade is a part of your strategy, but the best strategy is to defeat their invasion, impose costs in a way that is rational and tied to our strategic end, aims, which are basically to have them go back into their corner, nurse their wounds, and think five times before trying it again. We're not going to go for total victory, but we can selectively escalate. And this is one of the key concepts that I try to propagate that is related to nuclear, is the burden of escalation. And this is, from, you know, it's negotiation again, right? It's in a limited war, the other side is ultimately going to have to agree to stop fighting, right? So, but you want them to, to have the burden of the, of the, of the counter offer. So if we sink their fleet in the Taiwan Strait, and we're maybe doing strikes against the mainland and doing selective economic warfare that's very attractive. Our allies are with us. And the Chinese face the question they can, they can use nuclear weapons, but then they have the first ones to cross that horrible threshold over something that doesn't seem justified. They can expand the war, but then they're going to be the ones who seem like the Japanese in 1941. They're going to make enemies with everybody. We want them to be in that position, not us. And, and there's this argument that goes around these days that's like, we should automatically broaden a war to make it as big as possible and not concentrate on the locality. And that's literally the exact opposite of what we want to do. We want to, we want to, we want to deny them at, 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 at the point um, and then force them to have to make these terrible choices. The important thing, two important things that I think you'll appreciate, Mark. One is the military standard for denial is lower than we've become accustomed to in the last a generation, right? It's not desert storm level dominance. It's not we're going to own them, they're going to have to do what we say, no choice. It's simply saying you can't pull off sea lion. You can't get across the channel. You might be Napoleon, but you can't get across the channel. And then we'll figure out how to get them to settle through other, other means. The second point is it's a, a sort of a direct approach strategically, but not operationally or tactically. And I think this is something that sometimes gets lost um, in the kind of military discussion is this is kind of, you know, at the strategic macro level, we really want to focus in this limited way. But at the operational level, we can use all kinds of different things that are quite nonlinear and asymmetric to achieve those objectives. So it's kind of linear at the strategic level. Um, and then, but then like, you know, he's incredibly, well, I'm not going to use that example because it's too fraught these days. But anyway, sorry. Let's keep going. You can imagine who it might be. <laughs> yeah. All right. So there's a lot of discussion in uh, strategy over the years yeah. about cost-imposing strategies. Uh, that would seem to work fairly well with Russia, given their economic situation. Not so well maybe with China, given the fact that mm -hmm. they're prospering on our dollars. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, um, 
Cost imposing can be a little bit of a fuzzy term. So just to like be clear about when I think about it, I you know any any like sort of coercive act that we undertake is going to exert a, exact a cost from from our opponent. But I think what it means, what I take it to mean is in, in a different thing than denial. So we have denial basically being they are trying to achieve an objective and we stop them from doing that. And then cost is something else that they suffer about, but that might lead them to reconsider their primary objective. Um, in that sense, I don't think cost is, it, cost is, cost can be like the, vi the victory mechanism, but it's not the core of particularly the military effort. Um, and, and it gets back to a couple things. It gets to the asymmetry of resolve issue that like we don't want to get into a cost competition with the Russians or the Chinese. Um, it also gets into, uh, I actually don't agree about the Russians either because it's the strength of weakness argument, right? The fact that they are so weak and so brittle increases the ability, their, the credibility of their, their taking really aggressive counter reactions two things that we might do to exact cost. So I actually think horizontal escalation against the Russians, for instance, is really ill-advised because it's either feckless, as in it's like a token thing that, you know, you, I don't know, you sank a Russian ship somewhere in like the South Atlantic, or it's something that they're like, I can barely manage 11 time zones and I'm really worried about the sovereignty in my nation. And by the way, my threshold for nukes is the integrity of the state. And you've just brought that into question incredibly. And everyone's going to say, oh, yeah, no, the Americans just like out of nowhere just expanded this thing for no, no discernible reason. So I think that the, the focus of the military should really be on the denial piece. I actually particularly think for the army, because if you really want horizontal escalation, you don't need an army. An army is basically like a big, really hard to move thing that owns the land. Horizontal escalation is about going all over the place by air or sea or whatever. If we're going to have a horizontal escalation military, we could just get rid of the army which I just think would be a huge mistake, obviously. But like, let's, you know, if people actually want to make that argument, we should go, go through with it. And by the way, I, we should get a lot of money back as taxpayers because it's a lot less of a stressing uh, uh, scenario. Yeah. Uh, Steve Winters, uh, independent consultant. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, what I'm wondering is, uh, agreeing with what you've said about the need to disperse the forces, mm -hmm. um, uh, but when I look at the actual, uh, take Japan, for example, it seems like the move from Futama to Hanoko, uh, we're not really dispersing things. Uh, and then I mean, well, there are a lot of big bases that are there. And even when they're doing something new, it isn't dispersing. And I, I remember recently Robert Work said F-35 is fantastic in the air, but it's totally vulnerable on the ground. So you've got to have them all over the place, not just all on one airfield. So th what I can't understand is you're right. But why aren't we doing this? Well, that's what gets me up in the morning. I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, this is what I this is what I wonder about. Um, well, let me let me answer the substance first, and then the kind of theory of why we're not changing. <coughs> um, I think the substance is we're starting. You know, so I see some really promising shoots coming out of the ground, in particularly in the services. Um, and among allies, including Japan, uh, their national defense planning guidelines are uh, really encouraging. They have a quite aligned view. Um, and y y we won't always see in a day-to-day -day peacetime way, you know, what a, a more resilient architecture might look like. I mean, obviously, you know, we should see more purchasing of camouflage and dummy hangers and hardening and all these things. But... Um, a lot of it might just be the way the force is operating and thinking about developing new concepts that are like, well, in a day-to-day, -day, in an ungenerated, normal peacetime thing, we might use our nodal basis because it's cheaper and more convenient. But actually, we're thinking about you know, where we would go if things really go south. And actually, it'd be good to occasionally exercise that, or not regularly exercise that, and then because the, then the Chinese will say, A, they're taking this seriously, hmm, so this is real, B, they may be going there, but they may also be going over there, or even over there. And by the way, I don't even know. And then suddenly my 1,000 missiles, which I'm going to program five, you know, X for each target, and then I have to use them a lot. And then suddenly it doesn't seem like so much anymore when you're, when you're thinking conventional conflict. So bigger question, why aren't we doing more? Um, one of the reasons I think that I, uh, uh, without you know, being uh, presumptuous, that I think I could maybe have 
more of an impact at this stage outside of the department is because I think that it's a mindset issue. Um, that it is not a technical issue. We have brilliant people in the services, civilian analysts, you know, allies, who can solve this problem if we are focused on the right problem. But people are not sufficiently laser focused on the right problem. Um, and I think because they don't appreciate the threat. Now, I don't, when I say threat, I don't want to say like this is 1939. But it's like, you know, my favorite example is I think a lot of people are still thinking about the Boer War and we potentially have World War I looming over us. Um, and if you have World War I looming over, over you, you're not spending a lot of time on the Boer War. You're, you're covering down, but you, you know, if the British had had a serious land army that was ready uh, in 1914, the Germans probably wouldn't have invaded and World War I wouldn't have happened and Western civilization might be a lot better off today. Um, that's at least my theory. But, um, I think, uh, uh, you know, I think the task of the strategist is to try to shift things far enough in advance that you counteract things so they never, they never come to pass. So I think it's threat. And then I think there's a, um, there's a lack of clarity. There's a fuzziness. And that's one of the reasons that this piece in particular is to try to really put a very, very fine point on it. This is the problem. This is the hardest problem. If we solve this problem, we will be OK. We will have other stuff we need to cover down. If we don't solve this problem, we are in a lot of trouble, like big time geopolitical trouble. And, you know, I mean, I, there was an article in the, you know, another place yesterday saying, you know, Colby and these national defense strategy guys are, they're, they're not taking account of political whim and political reality. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going to accept political reality. Obviously, there's gambling in the casino. People make a strategic decisions. But if you can change minds, isn't that what a democracy is about? And so people like Evan, you know, who ha you know, that's the is to get it out beyond the defense wonks and the strategists to, you know, start talking about, hey, wait a minute. And, you know, uh, I guess we can't take our military superiority for granted. I get like one of these things that you get all the time, even from uniforms, is a war that would never happen. You'd never get a war with the Russia or the Chinese, Russians or the Chinese. And it's like that is just false. It's like the same people who said you'd never have a market crash before 2008. And the way you get a market crash is you act as if you would never have a market crash. Then you get really irresponsible behavior. Similarly, the way you get a major war is by acting like you will never have a major war and say, ah, we don't need to worry about Taiwan. We don't need to worry about the Baltics. They'd never do it. Interdependence, nuclear weapons. It's like, we would do it, <laughs> you know? And we're pretty nice. Sort of, but like you know, it's uh, I, that's that it's that sympathetic imagination <laughs> at some level that has to change, um, and then then it'll never happen. So we'll you know this is a ni this is a better problem to have than some of the alternatives, but you know we're not in a great place. Yeah, yeah thanks, Bridge and Evan. This is Tom Earhart from the Long Term Strategy Group. Um, you spent a lot of time putting the, the national defense strategy together. You spent a lot of personal time with then Dep DepSec Def Shanahan. Now the nominee. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a, a sense of where his personal leadership might be on this very same issue and what you're, you know, having worked with him mm -hmm. closely, where you think he would if he were? voted in, mm -hmm. what do you think effect he would have on the Pentagon, the Department of Defense? Well, thanks. And Tom has been a, a voice on these issues, the crucial voice for many years. So um, uh, standing on his shoulders, and among others. But look, <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm very hopeful about uh, Acting Secretary Shanahan. I worked closely with him. And um, I think the most important thing is whatever I think of him personally is he's laser focused on the national defense strategy. And he's a guy who's saying, this is the priority. You know, he said, China, China, China. And it's like, yeah, I mean, it ain't that complicated. Like, Russia is a big problem, too. But, you know, it's kind of like, keep it simple, stupid, at some level. And Shanahan is, he's laser focused. And he's in implementation mode. And he was there at takeoff. You know, there was a transition where Bob Work was still the de deputy for a little bit. But then Shanahan, and he came in, and he played an intimate role, a really important role uh, putting, especially putting teeth into the strategy, as he uh, as he would put it, um, and really trying to operationalize it. And now he's going to say, "Let's go do this." And he doesn't, you know, it's like he's one of those people who doesn't think that you have to accept the way things have been done will be the way things will be in the future. And some people say, "Well, he doesn't have the policy experience and so forth." And, you know, that's true. I mean, he's learning. 
I guess. You know, I mean, I, I don't work there anymore. Um, but it also gives him, like, here's my job. You know, and in some sense, the, the fundamental job of the Secretary of Defense is not another policy voice. That's a very important job. But the real job of the Secretary of Defense is to, you know, develop and field the nation's fighting forces that are prepared for the objectives that the political leadership and this, you know, strategy calls for. You know, that is, you know, he's got to do the, the diplomatic stuff, but the core of it is getting uh, 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 an armed force that is a, linked to our political needs. And that is what this, and, and, and I really commend him in his budget posture hearing, he talked about the Fed accompli specifically. That's the Secretary of Defense saying the Fed accompli is the core of the problem. So he gets it. So I'm a fan. Hi, uh, Zach Brown here from the Strategic Capabilities Office. Um, very loved your article, and I think that, I'm glad you mentioned mindset. Uh, and I think you said the f most important thing in the first sentence was, you know, American comparative military advantage is a thing of the past. It's right. fading quickly. Um, so how do we break that mindset within, not necessarily at the senior level of leadership in the department, yeah. because you know, Acting Secretary Shanahan, he seems to get it. Um, and then a lot, of the, a lot of the younger officers and green suitors coming in also seem to get it. But mm. that middle level, yeah. particularly in the department, the acquisition bureaucracy, mm. you know, the, uh, the congressional military industrial complex, how do we change and get that argument across that your last 20 years of experience – has essentially spoiled you for the kind of fight that we may be facing in the near term future, and how do we how do we get that message across more effectively? Well, uh, and thanks for your um, your words. I mean, and you guys in the Strategic Capabilities Office are, are awesome, and we're great partners in the NDS, and also actually are a pretty important part about this because you're particularly helping us in the near term to cover down on things that you know until we get to the third offset type force. We're going, to need, we're going to need to do deterrence in the near term with a force that's going to be substantially legacy uh, in, in composition, probably. So, so, you know, the kind of things you guys do is so, is so important um, and creative um, and actually consequential. Um, you know, that's a, I mean, that's like what I, what I think about. I, um, a former Undersecretary Flournoy, who used to be the CEO here, I think put it well the other day. She's like, our, our Fighting forces are the you know the envy of the world. There, but it's not clear that the 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 well, it's not clear. In fact, it's not the experience that they've had is not going to be the one that is what's going in the future. Um, how do you change people's minds? I'm just out there making the case. And what you know, the coolest thing to me is when I get an article or a, you know I get an email from a Marine you know major, or an Air Force one star, or uh, a Navy like lieutenant. That says, I got it. I'm so you know energized. We're working on. It. We're trying to figure out. I got these like, there were some special forces guys were emailing me. Hey, we got this idea that we're how do we do the Middle East in a more efficient way? And it's like to me the idea is like, wow, this is an amazing time to be a military officer. You know, like I'm jealous. Like now the strategist work is kind of like, well, you know, we'll keep talking about stuff and whatever. But like now it's an operational problem. You know, where you know, people talk about air land battle. Where's Don Starry? Where's Glenn Kent? You know, you make JSTARS work. You make the ground targeting work. I mean, uh, Marines uh, Ellis, you know, how do you make it? I mean, those are not, obviously, you don't replicate them precisely. But how do you make technology, the way you fight, work to, and whatever else is in that mix, come together to deal with a particular operational problem formed within a political military problem? And so the strategist kind of political level needs to say, here's the problem we need you to solve, and here are your broad boundaries, and we can negotiate about where exactly they are. But then, like, and, and the fact that it's a hard problem should be, like, exciting. Because, I mean, we have the best military, so presumably they want to work on a hard problem, right? That's what, you know, it's like Aristotle, right? The most fulfilling thing is to work on a hard problem and, and with, you know, intelligence and hard work, in, in a sense. And I, that's, and I, you know, when I, when I would engage with the Secretary Mattis about this, that was, when I, that was one of the things that I thought that he really, really wanted, um, was that he did not want a strategy that was, you will buy this many of X, and you will do it this way. And, that, and that's not what this is. You know? It's saying, Here, here's your boundaries so you can work within a cognizable problem. And then you guys are the professionals. You know, I mean, not just uniform, obviously, guys in, in places like SCO and the acquisition thing. And so I think, I think that's a lot more exciting than we're just going to do random stuff, and we're going to get called on by political leaders, leadership to do things. And, you know. and then the military, I think, the defense establishment, I mean, you know, the president has made it pretty clear he wants to um, stand firm against Iran, but also um, not 
do things like we've been doing them, which I think is exactly right. Um, uh, is for the is for the the military and the defense department particularly to say very candidly like look here are the implications of what you would want to do we don't live in unipolarity anymore so if you want to you know 120,000 troops on the ground you know that's going to be that's going to be an invitation to China and we're going to lose we're going to lose a huge edge there you know it's not ultimately the defense department's decision but they should be on you know they should be clear about that and I think I think. It sounds like that is pretty clear. Um, so you got to balance, but that's at least my theory. And then you know maybe good arguments went out. I don't know, hopefully, mine's good. I, I, not 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 clear to me. Just listening to this as an amateur, how big a shift this is in terms of. I know you don't want to get into weapon systems and all that, but no, no, no. how how big a acquisition shift is this? One and two. What are the forces arrayed against it? Bureaucratic, inertial, political, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, okay, so the first one, I mean, I, I would say there's a short and long-term thing. So the, the, the tale of military procurement, I mean, one of the reasons that strategy is important and consequential in the Defense Department sometimes, <clears throat> I think the most important reason is structural, is that the Defense Department is fundamentally a procurement organization, right? It's and so weapon systems last a very long time. So you have to have an assessment of the future and where you're going to prioritize because you're going to spend money. So, um, so what that means is, though, also is that things take a while to, to shift um, and political circumstances can change more, more, more quickly. Basically, I think we have a shorter kind of in, into a longer term thing. And, and um, I think, you know, the shorter term is to be able to generate this lethality and resilience to basically operate, yes, with new capabilities, like new kind of unmanned stuff, which is super important, but also off of legacy systems like aircraft carriers, like surface ships, like shorter range aircraft, you know, and be able, and that's a lot of- We can the, blunt with the force we have. Exactly, until, 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 and then, you know, as AI becomes much more, and this is a lot of what the Strategic Capabilities Office is doing, is, you extend the range of munitions. You know, I don't know. You put another rocket motor on it, or what? You know what I mean? Or you any number of things you can do. You put a different aircraft on the aircraft carrier. So you're going to have the aircraft carrier for a long time, but you can have an aircraft carrier with a range of X or a range of three X. You know, and a munition with a range of X or a range of three X. And that's a whole different proposition. Suddenly you have a different model. That's going to that can carry you for into into a certain a certain point of the future. Then. As we get into the more funky stuff, third offset kind of stuff, which is you know the future, then we can evolve into that at a more reasonable pace where we decide, okay, um, you know, is it going to be completely different? Is it going to be substantially different? What kind of models do we work? It gives us a little more time to work out and experiment without betting the farm on something. So that's that's kind of the what I'd say about that. And I, I mean, talk more specifically if you want, but but I would say the the resistance. I I don't think there's a strategic. I don't. I, I think the resistance. A lot of it's inertia. Is like my experience has been twenty years of this, and that's what I know, and that's what I believe is plausible. Um, you know, I there are all kinds of log rolling arrangements that have that have built in. I mean, like on Capitol Hill, if you have a factory in your district that's building a thing that's no longer relevant, you obviously your instinct is not to mess with it, right? Um, but I think the deeper one is in addition to sort of native human conservatism, which in an institution like the Department of Defense is ex even more than usually right. important, and it's worth remembering that the military services predate the republic, right. um, that um, that I, don't, I think there's a disbelief or a skepticism about the reality of this problem. And that ultimately, I think, implicitly is about arguments about how plausible war is. And again, that's why I bring up the market thing, because it's like, if you don't think a, fun, a Great Depression will ever happen again, then you can deregulate the market. If you think like, uh, yeah, it's World War II, you know, and I mean, it's rare for people to make the argument overtly. John Miller at Ohio State does, for, you know, he says, you know, interdependence, different, uh, Steve Pinker at Harvard, I think, makes these arguments, you know, that people are smarter than they used to be, they probably eat less lead, you know, Women's involvement, trade, blah, 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 blah. I'm a realist, you know. So I think war was possible in the Cold War. And the other thing about the the Cold War is like the regulators were pretty heavy 
You know, it's like it didn't just not happen. It was like there was a lot of thinking, you know, but so people don't remember that part. Uh, are, is it possible the services are tired of this grinding uh, now decades of war against the yeah, really states? Yeah, uh, They like to shift to something? So the a, services tend to like the strategy. So just like for the, there's the services, which are like the man, train, and equip. They kind of, they own the money. Then there's like the combatant commands, which are the two, those are the guys out, you know, the pro consul type thing. They're the, you know, the viceroys out there. Well, actually, they shouldn't be the viceroys. They should be the warfighters, really. But, um, and the kind of the joint staff over that. The services tend to be sympathetic to the strategy because the strategy is saying, you know, my, my, my kind of you know, sort of jocular example is like, if you made a movie about the American military of today, it would probably be some people out in a fire base in Afghanistan doing counterinsurgency somewhere or some CT thing. When they made a movie about the coolest part of the American military in the 1980s, it was about a training school in Top Gun. It was literally about a school. I mean, and it was, you know, it was a good movie, but like it was, that's it. have a dogfight to begin, but. Yeah, right, but like it's kind of, but it was like the, what the American military of the 1980s was trying to do after the disaster the debacle of Vietnam was like we and we are going to get our stuff in gear because we lost the edge and we are we are going to you know train up we're going to train up yeah. and they did Granada it was embarrassing and they you know and now we've just been doing stuff doing stuff doing and and, and this is the readiness crisis and, as well as sequestration and stuff <clears throat> but we want our military to get back into that mode and yes part of it can do a Granada or can do whatever um, and can stay active in the Middle East, but it's a much, much more narrowly focused and more cost-conscious approach. Richard Fontaine, CNS. Don't don't worry, Bridge. This, this won't Here be a hard one. <laughs> um, but I do have a question. I want to go back um, for a second to those um, – pesky people you dismiss as being concerned with the politics of all this. Um, and they may have been wrong on their specific uh, critique, but they probably are on to something given the way uh, our politics sort of looks these days. And it's related to what you're talking about at the very beginning of this. I think to paraphrase, I think you said something like a world or at least an Asia dominated by China, for example, we, we Americans would be poorer and less free. Uh, which is a pretty bold claim. And if that's true, then it's a hugely mobilizing sort mm -hmm. of truth to to internalize. And, you know, you go back to the Cold War, NSC 68, all these other kinds of things were aimed at drawing the specific linkage between the over there and the over here, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that this was a sort of a messianic um, Marxist-Leninist ideology that would <laughs> never stop until it had reached a, a world domination to include Americans and we'd have to live under their system, or it would exhaust itself and something else would happen. Guess which one we would prefer, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there was no kind of, they can do their thing over there and we can do our thing over here and it all kind of get along and maybe we'll trade a little bit. Um, so... We, we've drawn a defensive perimeter around the Chinese coast, and we say any intrusion in there, attempt to take Taiwan, to grab the Senkakus, even though they're uninhabited, to have a foreign policy veto and Finlandize uh, uh, the Philippines, all this kind of stuff's unacceptable to us. Mm -hmm. And in this room, that sounds really, you know, sensible. But how does that actually, any of that actually make the family living in the suburb of Chicago mm -hmm. poor and less free? Great, great question, and this is one I've been thinking of, and I actually, well, I want a, a, a very, very prominent academic was kind of stumped by this question, which kind of who's in favor of these kinds of things, and that sort of depressed me. I think it's pretty clear. I mean, I think it's basically like China would establish a hegemonial situation over Asia, which is the world's wealthiest um, region, and essentially set the terms of trade to make itself richer and almost certainly to make effectively make America poorer. And over time, that would, I mean, this is the least bad probably situation. Over time, that would make China much, much stronger and America relatively weaker. And if we think that like the 2016 interference in our election, which was uh, deplorable, was bad, imagine what a China that can have multiple of the power that the Russians have be able to interfere in our election. I mean, this is and I, I'll go back and I say, like, this is actually why we fought World War II, right? I mean, this is why we have not allowed a hegemon in Asia is because we basically want an open door. And the only the, the thing is, the reason it matters is not because we particularly care about a given country that much. I mean, we fought a war with the Vietnamese, you know. I guess that suggests we care about it. But um, 
but it's basically like because of the nature of the geography and also the distribution of wealth, the countries that we need to check and balance China are all over there. And if they get isolated, then we won't have the strength and that future will come to pass. So we have to do it over there. If Japan were located like right next to Hawaii, we would have a different situation. We'd have more running room. You know, we'd have more of a buffer, but, but we don't. And I think that's the, um, uh, that's the, that's the, key, uh, the key part of it. Um, and then there was something, and by the way, that doesn't even get into the possibility that China like over time would gain so much power that could actually project military power. I actually am pretty sanguine about that. Like I think America is very, very defensible like we have nukes and our conventional defense ability is very high. It'd be very hot, hard, and it's not clear why the Chinese would want to project power into North America. It's all the milieu goods that we live in. Like it's like, what's your 7G network like? Oh, your 7G network is all Huawei and all of your information gets rooted through them. Data privacy, all your you free speech rules on the internet or whatever it is at that time, the internet of things, oh, they're all like basically set by the Chinese and they pretty much suck up all the information. And because everybody else has to kowtow to them, right? Because, the, oh, Samsung realizes the Americans are out of it, so like, and we don't have a choice. We're gonna, we could have like a rinky-dinky little, you know, 7G system of our own, or, or the one that the Chinese uh, uh, set. And I mean, that's, again, that's, that's the most small C concern, that's sort of the most um, restrained vision of the future. That's not emphasizing the fact that they're like a Marxist-Leninist, you know, party dictatorship and the ideological aspect of it and so forth, so. Hey, Mark Phillips from uh, Institute for Defense Analyses. Um, you talked earlier about uh, when you're specifically about China, that you focus on denying them their ability to cross the strait. So that could at the mm -hmm. end of the, the conflict look like a stalemate. Mm -hmm. So in, 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 in ex by extension, you said do something, you know, you do some other things. What are those other things? And then how do you connect them to that military focus right. that you talked about? That's a great question. I mean, this is the kind of the war termination thing. I mean, I think this this language sounds defeatist sometimes to or like kind of uh, passive to military ears which want to take the initiative but um stalemate is a win i mean not to be like childish but like we won in korea like the chinese have a thing that they won and they beat the americans and that's true out of north korea but like our initial political objective was the restoration of the government of the Republic of Korea, and we did that over the south, over the territory south of the DMZ, 38th parallel or whatever. Um, so we achieved our objectives. So like, and, oh, and this is what I was going to say to Richard's point. Like, I actually am not an, a fan of NSC 68 that much, and and the NHTSA approach more, which is the kind of more more Manichaean. I mean, whether NHTSA actually believed it, I don't know. But like, I mean, Evan would know better than anybody else. But like, I'm more a fan of the kind of Eisenhower and, and Nixon and, and Kissinger, although I think they messed up on seeing the Soviet Union as an enduring power, but that's a separate issue. But basically that, you know, we need to defend ourselves and our perimeter, and then we will grow, and the power of our example will ultimately, you know, we are, politically, we are, from a political military point of view, we are status quo. From a kind of intellectual future of humanity point of view, we are you know, the power of our example, we're a city on the hill. You know, I'm kind of a city on the hill guy. And so everybody who wants to be with us, who wants to be free and independent and choose their own fate, they can come with us as long as we can defend them. And so that's, so we don't actually need to march on Beijing. They're the ones who need to impose their will on, on us and our allies. So in terms of the particular military problem, I think it's very, the Chinese, we should be clear to ourselves, so I don't have to do this rhetorically as a member or as a, as a department, but the mainland of China is a legitimate battlefield if it's being used to fight American forces. Now, there could be limitations, obviously, within that. I mean, we shouldn't just go attack Beijing willy-nilly. But, you know, if there are, for instance, targets uh, across the strait from Taiwan that are being, or, or assets that are being used, those should be fair. And we shouldn't think of that. And this is one of the problems sometimes with the, horse, the blockade arguments is we are self-deterring I mean, the Chinese have one, I believe, the world's most sophisticated integrated air defense system. Like, you don't have that if you're just going to go nuclear if somebody drops a bomb on your, on, your, on your territory. Now, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. That means that we should be prepared for strikes on CONUS, which is not entirely, you know, I mean, we're going to have forces operating from CONUS. So we need to think about that. And that's something I've given some thought to over the years. I think war termination is probably going to be a combination of economic pressure, selective strikes, 
um, and a perception politically <clears throat> that they don't have a strat they don't have a military or kind of coercive option that won't make it worse. I've been trying to think of what the analogy for this is, but it's like it's kind of like an anaconda. Actually, I guess it is an anaconda or boa constrictor because it's the more you wriggle and try to get out of it, the tighter it becomes. So it's like you know if they have to do something that then really ticks the Indians off, they've just made their situation worse. You know, it's like Germany in 1917 was like, we're, we can't break the stalemate on the Western Front. The Americans are supplying them, but they're not in the war. But our only way to do this is to go full bore against the American supply effort and try to beat the, try to beat the, the Entente in, in, in early 1918. I mean, World War One is generally not a good idea to Mimic, but that was that was the the situation, the kind of situation you want to force, where it's like, oh, they just brought the United States into the war, you know, that was dumb, you know, and then it's then it, then it's then they then they lose. Yeah, we're back. Hi, Mike Dunoff for you. Um, talking about being combat credible at the onset of hostilities, which I think is kind of unique uh, and is is the real power behind a strategy. Um, it seems like not only within the department, but also among our allies and partners, things need to change the way that we interact with them, the mm -hmm. things that we ask them to do. I just wanted to ask if you could provide um, some, some sense of prioritization among allies and partners and how we can optimize both our engagement with them and them within in order to really uh, make the strategy effective. Well, first I want to say Mike is a good friend. who was a leading contributor in the strategy, so he really has his fingerprints all over it. So. Uh, Honor, honor that. Um, uh, a great question, and I think this article, in some sense, is 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 designed as much for our allies and partners as for our, ourselves. Um, I think I touch on it in, in the piece. <coughs> I mean, basically, we want to create an integrated defense architecture. You know, we have a defense perimeter, um, and I, there are some implications of that. But that means both. Um, uh, in, in terms of defending against the hardest threats, but also in helping us manage some of the secondary or tertiary challenges that we face and that we can't ignore. So I would tend to, um, uh, you know, as a, as a macro level, I would say we should think about our allies as linking in as much as possible. And Secretary Mattis was very keen on this. He would always say interoperability, interoperability, interoperability. And he would say, I have never, he, I have never fought in a US-only formation. I think he wanted to get our, and that's something from the last 20 years that really could be carried forward very productively. So, but that's different than the kind of attitude that prevailed in the 90s and 2000s, which was like allies are good for symbolic and you can put their flag next to ours, but really we'd prefer to do things by ourselves. That's not, that's not really how we want to do things. So I would, I would put allies in a couple of different categories. First, they're the frontline allies. So the frontline allies, they have to focus on the contact and blunt layer. So contact being, don't let the Russians or the Chinese shape the information narrative such that they can they are advantaged as you go up the ladder of escalation. My favorite example, or one of my favorite examples here is, do we know if uh, if the British fired on the uh, on the town uh, the uh, Minutemen at Lexington? We're not one hundred percent sure. It might have been a son of liberty in the tavern across the green. That is a that is a classic little green men maneuver because it suddenly there's hornets of Minutemen coming out of the woodwork in all over New England, Massachusetts, and New England, and that's like. I don't know. Who knows? You know, and of course, Sam Adams is never going to fess up until maybe on his deathbed. <laughs> but like, you know, strategic effect achieved. So if, particularly if you're like in the Baltics or something like that, you do not, you cannot allow the Russians to come in and fake it that, that the Latvian Nazi special whatever has shot a bunch of Russian speakers. Okay. Then the really, the demanding thing is the blunt layer focus, which is again, and you know this better than anybody, is delay, degrade, deny. And this is particularly a more capable uh, uh, or exposed forward allies and partners. So Japan, which is in its NDPG, is aligned in terms of this blocking function, really focused not on contributing forces to operations in Afghanistan or something, but sink Chinese ships before they land on Japanese islands, shoot down Ch Chinese aircraft before they can achieve effects, um, jam, maritime, you know, deny the uh, maritime environment to the adversary, try to get ISR and uh, maritime domain awareness for us. Taiwan. Taiwan must become more of a porcupine. It has to implement the overall defense concept. It cannot ask too much of the American people, to Evan's question, 
it must move forward on that. And it, Taiwan has to change more than anybody. I believe in defending Taiwan. I think we should be clear about it. But if, they, if Taiwan asks too much of us, they could get the wrong answer. And they, there are things that Taiwan can do, both on the invasion threat and the blockade threat, that are very meaningful, that are within its power to do. I'm happy to talk more about that. Or I mean, I wrote something in the Taipei press the other day. Poland and Europe, they're actually doing very well. Ground forces blocking. Um, the Scandinavian countries are doing pretty well, including our, not, our partners like Finland and Sweden. The Swedish Defense Commission just released its report, which is quite encouraging. Germany is a huge problem, and I've told them this to their faces repeatedly, so I'm not telling them anything they don't know. It is unacceptable for Germany to be not resourcing the collective defense. Nobody benefited more from collective defense after the Second World War, which they caused, than Germany. The least they can do today is contribute to collective defense, and that means Primarily, Germany had 12 active divisions along the inner German border when they were defending themselves in 1988 and three in ready reserve. Now they have none. I mean, they could probably cobble one together. If they could put three divisions in the field in a, couple, in a week or two and get to the uh, eastern Poland, uh, we'd all have a lot less of a problem in Europe. And that would then relieve us to do, not that we're going to extract from Europe, but it would relieve our force requirements. Then, okay, so then we, those are that kind of front layer. Countries like Vietnam, uh, they should focus on, on, on blunting. I think um, then there's kind of a second layer of countries that are more capable that could contribute, uh, like Germany, but then like the UK, France, Australia, contribute to the, the, the close-in tough fight. So they should be thinking about trying to align with us and contributing there. <clears throat> then I would think about countries or partners, allies or partners, that could help manage secondary threats. Um, here I'm thinking of Italy, France, Spain. I mean, France is kind of dual, as usual. Um, even countries in Latin America, uh, in countries in the Middle East, uh, where we could say, you know, can you cover down in the way that, that the Europeans and French are doing, say, in North Africa? And then I think, you know, macro, macro we need a different relationship with our allies. First of all, it's got to be more equitable. And that is, we were talking about the entitlements issue. That's an entitlements issue. The president is giving us an opportunity right now by being really, really direct about the equity issue. But we have not, we are not, at some point we're going to deal with the fiscal issue and Americans are going to be asked to say, you should spend 3 to 4% of your defense basically force planning to defend other people. Meanwhile, those people are only spending 1%. No, that's not going to fly. And it's not right. It's not fair, and it's not going to work. The second is we can't do everything ourselves. So we need to ask more of our allies and partners. That means the instinct for the last 25 years has been we need to reassure our allies and partners. No, some of our allies and partners, like Taiwan, we need to scare because they should be scared. And I mean, we should reassure you to a certain level, but you should also do your, your part. And same with Japan, and same with Germany. So it's a, you know, and this is how it was in the Cold War. It was not, it was much more of a give and take, and much more, uh, you know, these are, let's be honest, these are not friendships, these are not love affairs, these are partnerships founded on enlightened self interest that can then have friendship on top of them. Yes, we're all friends individually, but as nations, we need to look after the interests of our own people. So I think that's then. And then another point is, we're, we're not going to have allies necessarily like we had after World War II. After World War II, from a strategic perspective, not a political perspective, but from a strategic perspective, we kind of formed protectorates. We demilitarized, well, MacArthur demilitarized Japan, which we very quickly re realized was a mistake. And then, you know, we occupied, along with the other powers, Germany and kind of restricted their strategic autonomy in both cases. And we essentially issued unilateral guarantees to places like Korea and so forth. That was the old days. That was, those were all formed when the United States was 50% of global GDP after the cataclysm that was the Second World War. We don't stand in that position anymore, and we, but we don't need to. India is going to be our most important, one of our probably two most important allies in the world in the future. They don't need us to defend themselves. We don't want to defend them, you know, to take on that burden. They don't want us to. They're proud, independent people who earn their independence the hard way. Great. Same here. You know, so you cover your part. We're both, we, we both don't want a region dominated by the Chinese. Okay, you got that. We'll get your back. You know, we'll cover the, the maritime part of Asia, and, you know, we're, we're in it together. I mean, you can talk about the specifics. But, I mean, India and America are as much allies as Britain and France were in 1914. You know, we can, we can sign a treaty or not, but, you know, it's like, as an analytical matter, that's where we are and should be. Um, but I think it's kind of a different, it's, you know, it's a di and it's hard for the blob, you know, sort of speaking as a somebody who could be accused of being part of it. Um, it. The blob is so used to being the imperial center of goodness, and we stand on our, sh the sh we see farther, and we're indispensable, and, and that's actually 
largely true, but it needs to be taken down from like 11 to like 5, you know, and kind of more equity in it. Uh, what, my impression, again, as an outsider, is that we're getting close to the point, if we're not already there, that we're China or, and or Russia could turn off our lights anytime they wanted to. How does that play into all this? Yeah. I mean, it's a form of escalation. I mean, you know, that's, it's not, it's basically this kind of cost imposition um, kind of thing. They could turn off our lights, but we can do things back to them too, right? And a lot of the things that, so there's a deterrence aspect. A lot of the things that we need to do about that kind of thing are really sort of um, putting our own house in order. I mean, I think like, for instance, cyber attacks, you know. And I mean, other people know a lot more about this than I. But I mean, I think our cyber architecture was basically developed in the 1990s um, with the idea that we were in a post-historical world, that like security and the state were kind of passe. And so you didn't need to take account of security precautions and build in resilience. And now we're paying the price, which is you got to, you know, we all put locks on our doors and, you know, you get out flood insurance and, what, you know, you take basic precautions that we just didn't take. And now people are like, oh my God, people might steal from banks. And it's like, well, you know, yeah. So, so you don't, what we don't want, cyber is not about perfect defense. Cyber is about, and this is true across, effective de de deterrence is about raising the threshold high enough that your, your effective res deterrent retaliatory threat is credible. So like... Is ours? Um, it's it's going to get better. And I think the administration has been good on being more forward-leaning on cyber authorities. Um, which is important, and just showing that you're willing to, but, you know, the other thing is, like, there's going to be, you're never going to get to, like, perfection. There's going to be crime in the city, you know. Okay, last question, anybody? Don't, I can't believe you've drained the cup of Bridge Colby here. There's, there's, there's always more. It's always uh, I'll ask you a last yeah. question. Are any politicians paying, paying attention to this? Yeah, I think so. I think increasingly, I think um, um, I would say um, Senator Inhofe, the chairman of the uh, Senate Armed Service Committee, you know, asked, uh, had testi this testimony is just to open the, the SASC for this Congress, which suggests the defense committees are on it. Um, there are a couple of really, really, really smart new members like uh, Senator Josh Hawley from Missouri and uh, Congressman Mike Gallagher from, uh, from Michigan. Um, I mean, these are all Republicans, but just because I happen to know them more. But um, uh, I would say um, there are there is a much deeper growing sense of the challenge to American geopolitical advantage, particularly from China. I think if you look at Senator Warner from Virginia, there's a lot um, we're doing. I think we had him. He spoke here, right? I don't know if there, Senator Rubio from Florida. You know, his tone is quite quite different than it was five or six years ago. Um, I'm trying to think who else would be uh, on the Dem side. Anybody? Well, I mean, I think you know. Even look at the tariff thing. Like, I mean, I'm, I generally don't agree with Senator Schumer, but I mean, he he's been tough on the Chinese. He sees what they're what they're up to. And I, I we had a group come here from India a couple months ago, and I, it was funny because uh, I gave this kind of thing, and 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 he said oh, that's that's great, but you're a total uh, dove on China compared to Nancy Pelosi. So, you know, my sense is there's on the geopolitical level and the sense that there's, a, you know, great power competition has gone from being archaic to being a cliche. So, you know, that's in some sense. Uh, I mean, I, I would assume that. you want this to be a, an issue in the presidential election. Yeah, I don't want it to be a partisan soon? issue. You don't, yeah. I don't want it to be a partisan issue. I want it to, I'd like it to be who's better at doing this. I don't want it to be, you know. But I think, you know, I mean... Well, I think it's going to be, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be tough. One of the things is, you know, for instance, on the nuclear stuff, Congressman Smith, the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, is very keen on anti-nuclear stuff, which I disagree with generally. But, but I would say, if you want to keep the nuclear threshold high, and if you want to stem proliferation, you want as effective a conventional deterrent as possible, and that's what this is. So, if you are anti-nuclear, you should want something like this. Yeah. Okay, fascinating. All right, thanks, Evan. Thanks. Thanks.